On this episode of China Unscripted, the US, UK, and Australia have formed a defense pact to counter China as China grows more and more aggressive over Taiwan. But is it too late to stop the Chinese Communist Party? Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chap. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. And joining us today from Australia is Lincoln Parker. He's the chair of the Liberal Party's Defense and National Security Policy Branch. Well, Lincoln, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. It's an absolute honor to be on the show with you guys. I love what you do. You're at the, the vanguard of tackling the probably the biggest issue that's facing not just the United States, but certainly Australia as we're in the thick of it. So thank you for what you do. It's my pleasure. Well, thank you. Tell tell me more. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, okay. So, so, so to get serious, um, you know, I think Australia and and New Zealand really have been uh, sort of the Chinese Communist Party's testing ground for uh, influence tactics that they use against the West. Uh, but it seems like China pushed too far in Australia, and there's been a big pushback from the Australian government society. And uh, the most recent example is uh, AUKUS, an alliance between the US, UK, and Australia. But it's not, is, is AUKUS something that Australia would have done even three years ago? Absolutely not, Chris. You're, you're so right. China has been trying to hollow out our, I guess, our will, our willpower from within. I mean, they're very different from what the Soviet Union was trying to do to the West, and that was frontal attacks. Whereas with mm-hmm. the West, and, and particularly in Australia, we've been a test bed, and you mentioned New Zealand as well, and and perhaps let's not use Australia and New Zealand in the same breath. Um, yes. Because we are different countries, and we are certainly looking at our China relations very differently. And so China has been um, trying to subvert our democracy for quite a long time, and you mentioned the Australian government. It's certainly been the Liberal government has been undertaking a very concerted pushback ever since the time of Malcolm Turnbull. Mm. The, the Liberal Party in Australia being the Conservative Party. Yes, that's right. So we're down under, so things flip, right? So Liberal... They, they spin in, this, in the opposite direction. Basically. That one too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the Liberal Party of Australia is our uh, right of or centre-right party, conservative party, a little bit akin to your Republican party. Um, We are a big tent, so of course we have different views, but certainly under the Morrison government, Scott Morrison is the current Prime Minister of Australia, we've been very front-forwarded in tackling the Chinese issues of of coercion, subversion. Um, I mean, you've seen what they're doing in terms of trade. They've put massive tariffs on all sorts of our products from wine, barley, um, wheat through to even coal. But now, as you have seen, they're running out of uh, of energy supply. They can't even heat their homes. uh, And now they're having to return to buying Australian coal. Just just wait till they run out of wine. Well, it seems they could use the Australian lobsters as a fuel source. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so, so when they did that, we, it was actually great for Australia, right? Because we suddenly had $20 lobsters to buy. It was fantastic. Oh. Yeah. All right, we're making a trip to Australia. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we want actually, to do that right now. Actually, that is impossible uh, right now, actually. Uh, so to get back to AUKUS, like, so why, why now? Like, what changed that this is something Australia would want to do? Yeah, so... Australia has always been reticent to go down the nuclear power path. It's always been reticent to go down the nuclear weapons path, and that's not what AUKUS includes, just to be very clear. It's nothing to do with nuclear weapons. However, it's it's inescapable, and you've been living under a rock if you haven't noticed that China is the world's most aggressive bully um, to smaller countries in particular. I mean, they're even bullying the United States. I don't know why and why the United States is not pushing back a little bit firmer. However, certainly Australia, we're a population of 25 million, which is a little bit over half of the population of California, Um, yet we inhabit a very large continent island. So we are, and particularly if we are cut off, by the Chinese Navy 
um, and you've had Cleo Pascal on before, I know. Um, you can see what the Chinese are doing in the Pacific Islands. Uh, that could certainly cut us off from any American aid. So I think Australia has looked at the imminent threat that China poses um, us and said, look, it is time for us now to have a capability that can certainly uh, help us defend ourselves a lot better than what conventional submarines can do. And so we all understand that nuclear propulsion provides um, a much better, stronger capability for submarine and underwater forces um, than does a you know, diesel electric submarine, which has to surface all the time. It doesn't have the same kind of range. Um, it's, it's, not, it's just not as capable. And so I think that's, you know, some people have said that's crossing the Rubicon, and I'm really glad that this government has done that because you know, at the end of the day, the government's first role is to look after the safety and security and sovereignty of its citizens. Um, and we can see what China is doing. We've seen what they've done to Hong Kong. We see the constant threats that they're pushing on to Taiwan. Uh, we see what they're doing around the world. We see what they're doing in the Pacific Islands. And we see what they do to us every day through the cyber attacks, through, you know, they've tried to bribe politicians in the past, Labor politicians. Uh, you would have remembered Sam Dastiari, Senator Sam Dastiari, who had to resign because of that. They gave us a list of 14 demands. This is all while they claim to not want to interfere in the domestic politics of other countries, right? So it's pretty clear what they're trying to do to us, and we didn't want to lay down and take that like some other countries do. So what's what's been the Chinese Communist Party's response to AUKUS? I mean, as you, as you mentioned earlier, China's not been happy with Australia sort of standing up. Uh, the economic sanctions, the import tariffs that have been put on because the Australian government asked for an investigation into the origin of the coronavirus. So how have they responded to AUKUS? Well, they haven't responded um, as belligerently as we'd expect, actually. So of mm. course, of course, they've come out um, through their mouthpiece, the Global Times and China Daily and and other publications, and they've said that, you know, we're warmongers um, and that we're the, you know, the whipping boy of the United States, um, just the, all of the usual kinds of stuff. But they've been saying this rubbish for so long, and we see it in Australia so often that it just doesn't make any difference to us anymore. And so, you know, we don't really listen to it. Um, we take their threats very seriously, and that's exactly why we've gone into walkers. And so, if anything, they should be looking at themselves within to say, why would Australia, a country that has in the past always looked to never go down the nuclear route, and suddenly they are. And so, they are the entire reason, whilst the government may not state that um, as bluntly as I have, and I don't speak on behalf of the government, but it's clear that is the exact reason why we are doing that, to protect ourselves from them. It's almost as if when you stand up to a bully, they back down. Well, I'm not sure they'll back down, Chris. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and we can get into the conversation at Taiwan um, at a, a later stage, but, you know, things aren't looking good in Taiwan uh, right mm -hmm. now. You know, I mean, we're just seeing the Chinese continue to increase their their flights into Taiwan's air identification zone. Um, we're continuing to see the rhetoric being ramped up um, on them wanting to reunify with Taiwan, although we know that that's, you know, they've never been one nation. Um, so we're seeing the propaganda and the, the threats really ramping up on Taiwan. And Taiwan is a very significant and strategic um a democracy in in Asia um, that we need to protect and defend um, for all of the reasons that I just mentioned. I mean, they are free peoples. They are a democracy. They are about the same size as Australia. In fact, they're about 25 million people. We do a lot of trade with them as well. We should stand, as our former Prime Minister Tony Abbott said yesterday in Taipei, we should stand shoulder to shoulder with like-minded, freedom-loving democracies. 
Um, but from a military perspective, that's the first island chain. So if China is able to take Taiwan, they've suddenly been, they have complete access out and can break outside of the first island chain into the Western Pacific, which, you know, obviously Guam is going, your territory is going to be one of the first targets, but it also directly threatens Australia. It threatens all of our trade routes. And we understand through their aggressive stance that it's not going to stop with Taiwan. And if they take Taiwan, it also tells the rest of the region that, hey, what's happened to the United States? They couldn't defend Taiwan. Don't they have a treaty with them? Now, look, I understand that the treaty doesn't oblige the United States government to necessarily go in and put boots on the ground. However, perception is reality. We know that Taiwan is an ally of the West. It's an ally of the United States. It's an ally of of all of the democracies. And so if China takes Taiwan, it's a big deal. The rest of the Asian region will fall. And we understand that. They may not fall immediately, but but what's you know, what's gonna happen with Malaysia, what's gonna happen with the Philippines, what's gonna happen with with Thailand? We know that they're not strong enough at all and, and Vietnam, they're not strong enough to resist this massive bully. And so that is a big deal and that that threatens our sovereignty um, immensely. And so from a humanitarian standpoint, a freedom standpoint, a democracy standpoint, and a military and a sovereignty standpoint, Australia must stand with Taiwan. Is that what Australia is signaling by um, Tony Abbott, the former prime minister, going to Taiwan? Uh, Officially, no. So Tony Abbott is a former prime minister. He is not employed by the government. He is he has travelled there as a private citizen. He is not the prime minister's envoy as he's done in the past. Um, having said that, I think it is uh, it does send a strong signal. Um, if you've been looking at the media over the last day, and certainly the social media over the last day on Twitter, it has been full of quotes from former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, his support for the free peoples of Taiwan. And, you know, maybe maybe it is time that the, a discussion is, head, is held um, at some point that, that maybe Taiwan should become independent. Um, you know, we, we know that under this Chinese regime, we have seen a constant trajectory over the last 70 years. Um, it's, it's just been going on an upward trajectory of militarization um, and aggressiveness. And so one could make the argument that sooner or later, um, probably sooner than later, that China is going to attack Taiwan. So why not? Um, but, but Shelley, to answer your question, officially the answer would be no. The Australian government has not changed its policy. Um, I would think that Tony Abbott does probably speak on behalf of a lot of Australians in a private capacity. I'd, I'd certainly be one of those Australians. I, w- I absolutely support what he has done and what he has said. And I think uh, certainly if you, you read the media accounts, many Australians also support his actions over the last couple of days. So yeah, this is kind of like a, a page from the Chinese Communist Playbook, which is like, oh, you know, this, you know, this company is a totally private company with no connection to the government. And now Australia is basically taking a, a totally private citizen. I mean, I'm not saying that he's connected to the government, but there's obviously that perception, right? I think the U.S. did that recently, too, actually, when... Yeah, like, who was it that, that went over there completely on his own? It was Pompeo did after he... Didn't he? Didn't he? Okay. Okay. Pompeo, if he didn't go, he was going to go. But like... There, there are cases where they send people who are not in the government anymore. When you say they send people, who's doing the sending? You're saying that the, the private citizens the go private completely citizens on their go own. Completely on their own. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, as Lincoln said, perception is reality. Yeah. So how? So you, you say the um, average Australian citizen uh, supports Taiwan? Do you think that's the case? Do, do they know why Taiwan is so important? I don't think the average citizen probably knows why Taiwan is important militarily. And I think that's certainly a job that the government needs to to do better. And and as chair of the Liberal Party's defence and national security policy branch, that's something that I try to do both internally within the party, because there's also a lot of party members 
who have no idea of why Taiwan is strategically and militarily crucial to the safety of Australia. Um, but, uh, but what we do certainly since COVID times, um, a lot of it, well, all of our meetings are now just like this. So they're, they're done by a video conference. Um, and we've opened up our video conferences to not just party members, but to others. And so, yeah, I, I think that Australian public supports Taiwan more because they see Taiwan as a fellow democratic, freedom-loving society that doesn't want to get crushed under the boot of the Chinese communists. Um, Australian public, um, you know, our media has been quite good at showing what the Chinese communists have been doing to the Uyghurs and to Hong Kong. So this whole one country, two systems thing, well, how did that work out for Hong Kong? It didn't. The Chinese communists lied. They had a deal in place um, with the British. They broke the deal. They did whatever they wanted and they crushed whatever democracy and freedom that was left in Hong Kong. So Australians have seen that on, the me on our media and they've seen the, the concentration camps where they're, they're shaving the heads of these, these poor Uyghurs simply because they're Muslim and they're, they're not ethnically Han Chinese and they're sticking in, them in so-called re-education camps. Um, so the Australian public kind of looks at that and goes, well, hang on, that's not right. That's not cool. It's not fair. Well, why, why would we support China so you know, reunifying um, with Taiwan when we know that they will crush them and they have thousands of missiles pointed at them and they fly their fighter jets at an increasing number over their island every day? That doesn't sound like peaceful reunification to anybody. So... Yeah, so besides obviously the moral support uh, or, you know, that Australians feel towards Taiwan, uh, walk us through what would be, you know, over time the direct impact on Australians should the Communist Party successfully conquer Taiwan and bring it under their rule? Like what's going to happen to the rest of Southeast Asia and the neighboring islands? Well, yeah, it's a good question, Matt. I mean, it's it's scary because, as I said, we, we aren't a major superpower. We're a small country living on a very large island. Uh, we only have 25 million people. Our armed forces, whilst very high quality and awesome fighters, are really tiny. If, if we were to have a head-to-head -head war with the Chinese military, we'd last five minutes. Um, we, we have to fight with an ally. We have to be able to fight with the with the United States um, and and others if they were to to come along. Um, so I think what China tries to do, and we talked about this before, is rather than what the Soviets did, which was full on frontal attacks all of the time, China tries to rot you from within. And so the liberal governments under both Malcolm Turnbull and Scott Morrison, have been trying to stop that from a legislative perspective. So we don't, you know, we've banned Huawei, for instance. We have legislation that prevents um, foreign interference, foreign in influence, and all those sorts of things. And they're squarely aimed at China, even though that's not stated. I mean, it's aimed at any country, but really it's only China that does that on any major scale. So, so what would happen if the Chinese communists were to take Taiwan would be, as I said before, the other countries in the region would begin to, to submit to China's will. I'm, I'm not saying that China would go and necessarily um, invade the Philippines. They may build more artificial islands. They may take an island or two from perhaps uh, from Japan um, that, that, we, that we, we, we can talk about later. Um, but we will see that these other countries in the regions will essentially become vassal states. Um, now, in time, when Australia is ringed, we are encircled, what are you going to do? And then you've got the other half of the Australian politics being the, the Labor Party. And, okay, sure, I'm, I am partisan, um, but I would give them due if there was due to be given. The Labor Party come out very strongly with an engagement policy with China. They've always wanted to engage 
um, and manage the China relationship. So the Labor Party of Australia, or the Australian Labor Party's patron saint is a guy called Gough Whitlam, who was a, a disaster as a prime minister. But his claim to fame was that he got to Beijing before Nixon and started our, um, our diplomatic relationship. And f- since then, you've had a number of Labor leaders whose mantra is to engage, engage and work with the Chinese, which is, you know, what we did right up until Malcolm Turnbull sort of said, well, hang on, no, this is, this is not right. Um, and Scott Morrison has actually taken the, the ball from uh, Malcolm Turnbull and run even further with it. Well, so I'm glad you brought this up. Like Australia has changed dramatically in its view of China over the years. But as I understand, there is still pushback against that, that there are some elements of the government, maybe society, that want to return things to the status quo. Well, that's right. So, of course, you're going to have some elements of business that want to make money. And I get that. You know, you're a business. You want profit. Um, China is our largest trading partner, um, primarily because they buy our iron ore and our coal. Um, but they used to buy all sorts of stuff from wines and sorghum and, and you mentioned lobsters and um, things like that. So you, you're going to get pushback from certain elements of the business community who want to make money. And that's pretty much how New Zealand runs its foreign policy. It's a mercantilist sort of foreign policy, like uh, well, mercantilist and defeatist, in my opinion. Um, and then on the other side of politics, as I mentioned, you've got the Labor Party, um, which is, is sort of similar to your Democratic Party in some ways. Um, however, they've sort of left representing the worker. Um, and you've got former prime ministers who are on the payroll, Labor prime ministers who are on the payroll of the Chinese. So you've got former Prime Minister Paul Keating, who, came, who is always, he has an acid tongue and he comes out and he insults America as much as he possibly can. He insults our Australian government as much as he possibly can. Um, he's also on the board of the China Development Bank, uh, right? And and a friend of mine said, well, you shouldn't say that he's on the payroll because he's he's it's actually an unpaid position. And I said, well, how's that any better? So he's working for the Chinese for free. Um, um, and then you've got um, your friend, Kevin Rudd, um, who's... Uh, who lives just around the corner in, in New York, and he works for the Asia Society, and, and he's also a uh, China engagement manager. Um, and then you've got you've just got the Labor Party themselves, who who agree with managing the China relationship through engagement. We all understand what engagement means. It means giving in to the Chinese Communist Party. It means going back to the old days where they had a lot of influence over us and could call the shots on foreign policy and and could go through their list of 14 demands that they had of the Australian government, and we would put up with it. Um, So essentially, you become a vassal state. Now, for the elites, that's great. So if you're an elite academic, if you're Paul Keating, or if if you're an elite politician, or you you sell a lot of coal, you're probably going to be okay, right? But for the average Australian, you don't want to be a vassal. You know, a lot of Australians fought and died and spilled blood for this country actually alongside the Americans to do that, particularly in World War II, and they want to keep our freedom and they want to keep our democracy. And so, yeah, we're kind of battling against that. And, um, you know, I am getting political uh, and I am in the Liberal Party. I do want to see Scott Morrison return. We're going to have an election early next year. Um, It's not just because I'm a Liberal. I'm certainly no one-eyed Liberal and I get in trouble for saying things all of the time. I I don't particularly want to be a politician myself. Um, But I worry that if we do elect a Labor government, that we will go back to the good old days of engagement and managed relationship and and bowing down and kowtowing to China. Um, That'd be disastrous. You mentioned, uh, you know, the business people who want to do business in China and do the trade and things like that. And I think when you mentioned the U.S. earlier could take a harder stance against China than it is doing, I think that's one of the main battles we're facing. Um, Politically in D.C., it seems like uh, standing up to China has become one of the few bipartisan issues that's happened over the last couple of years, especially with what's happened in Hong Kong with with the Uyghurs. But there's still this very large Wall Street business lobby that is constantly trying to, um, you know, push back to like, you know, let's not decouple, let's recouple uh, with China. 
as the trade representative just said, you know, durable coexistence, yeah, whatever that means. She also used recoupling in her mm. speech that she used, said recently. Uh, and, you know, I was wondering in Australia, with the punishment that you've been going through on the trade sector over the last year, essentially, um, has that changed people's minds about trading with China? Or are people still, like, are the business people still that gung-ho about it? So I don't think it's changed the minds of the average citizen whatsoever. So if you look at the polling that we take on a, a, a regular basis of, of Australians' attitudes towards the Chinese Communist Party, um, you know, they've fallen off a cliff. Um, so business are, are aware of that. Um, so they have to tread cautiously. You know, we, in recent times, we've, we've heard the, the business lobbyists come out and, and say that we should start re-engaging with China. So we do have some of that. We don't have as powerful uh, a Wall Street that you have that makes, you know, trillion, you know, billions of dollars or whatever it is off doing business with China, whether people win or lose, they still take their cut. So we don't have that. And, and what the Australian government also did was to try and use our trade agencies as best as we could to try and find other markets for our goods and services. And so when you look at the totality of trade, whilst they hit us really hard on a number of our exports, and, and we've talked about those, and um, sorghum and wine and whatever, um, the, the overall trade has kept pretty steady because the price of iron ore was was at record highs and so we make a ton of money from exporting iron ore which we do to china um primarily um but but also coal so um particularly with this energy crisis the coal price has gone up so our our export earnings are haven't taken that big a hit actually so, so it, it, from an overall perspective, it hasn't their trade war against us, um, even though they're meant to be members of the WTO. Their trade, their trade war against us for for you know, political reasons has not worked. So, uh, sort of a theme we've been having is the idea of you know perception is reality. You've been saying that the Australian public, the view of China has fallen off a cliff. What is being done to sort of uh, manage the perception of China, both within the government and in Australian society at large? Is it just something that's naturally happening as people, as the Australian media is reporting on issues like Hong Kong, the Uyghurs, or is there anything that can be done to really clarify in people's minds what the Chinese Communist Party is, especially when you have politicians who are arguing for recoupling? Yeah, that's a really good question, Chris. And and I'd, I'd say that this trip that former Prime Minister Tony Abbott made to Taiwan over the last couple of days is one of those efforts. Now, he did that as a private citizen and, and probably in response to exactly what you're saying because he's he's probably, heard, well, he, he certainly would have heard um, the, the Australian Labor Party start saying these sorts of things and, and getting back into their old habits. Um, and he, he also wanted to support Taiwan. So I think... I think, yes, I think we do need a more concerted effort. And, and as always, we, you know, we're led by what you guys do. So anything the United States does, we listen to. Um, you know, there used to be that catchphrase in, in Australia all the way with LBJ. Um, so we, you know, we've fought uh, alongside the United States in every single conflict you've been in, and Vietnam was just one of them. Um, so I think certainly leadership from the United States would be really beneficial. And, and Shelley was talking about, um, you know, the China issue being bipartisan in the United States. And I've kind of seen the, the, the talk over China has, has slackened a little bit from U.S. government sources over the last mm -hmm. number of months. Um, and you, you've, you've seen that the, your trade representative is, is talking about perhaps reducing some tariffs on some certain things with China that had been put in place by the former Trump administration. The, the conference that they had up in Alaska was mm, kind of embarrassing. I certainly think that given you are the world's sole superpower, you, you really could perhaps do more 
um, in terms of leadership on the China question. And, and that would be of great benefit to the region, including Australia. Are there specific things you'd like to see? Well, I'd like to see the administration come out and talk about it and, and talk about um, and talk about the, the situation with the Uyghurs. Talk about what happened in Hong Kong um, and maybe perhaps tie that to the situation that we're seeing in Taiwan. Um, we've seen reports that perhaps there has been over the last year, which would put this that policy back into the Trump administration, that there's been US Special Forces and Marines in Taiwan. Now, they mentioned two, a couple of dozen. It's not really all that many. So perhaps talk about doing more exercises with the Taiwanese, perhaps bring them into um, joint military exercises that the United States already does with countries like Australia. So we, we exercise all of the time. Um, militaries exercising together is crucial um, because when you're going to fight together, it's like playing, you know, American football or a rugby. If you, if you don't train together, you're really not going to play the game very well, right? So, um, you know, I think that sort of, I'm not saying that the administration should come out and, and, and say that Taiwan should declare its independence. I'm, I'm just saying that perhaps by taking some more concrete measures and, and perhaps talking about it a little more would certainly help the region and, and certainly Australia also. Now, uh, you mentioned this sort of, uh, you know, idea that Australians have fought with the U.S. and and different wars since Vietnam, right? LBJ all the way, right? But, uh, you know, given how, you know, Vietnam didn't seem to end very well and Afghanistan uh, didn't end particularly well, uh, are Australians a bit averse maybe to getting involved in another American war? Or do they see it that way if it came to defending Taiwan? Yeah, so I... I I wasn't alive. Well, I was alive at the end of the Vietnamese War. Um, it's a good question, um, and I think it's a case that we need to make to the Australian public. So certainly the Australian public, as we discussed before, um, has an affinity with the Taiwanese people and certainly doesn't want to see them crushed and their freedom and democracy taken away. Um However, it's a different story when you, if you're the government, um, when you are, you want to put Australian lives at risk. Um, I think there, as we, we talked about before, there's certainly a very strong argument, case, truth, fact to be made to the Australian public of why Taiwan's independence or its freedom, its current status, is crucial to our own sovereignty and future sovereignty. So I think I think you can, you know, if you're a good communicator, I think you can make that case relatively easily that if for nothing else, it's in our own interests to defend Taiwan. Um, so, and, and and hopefully you you would think that other nations would would feel the same. Um, but uh, I think. Perhaps former Prime Minister Tony Abbott's trip is probably the thing to kick that off. Um, it's getting a lot of airtime. It's getting a lot of coverage over here. Um, and I think that perhaps that's going to get, get the ball rolling to start having more of those sorts of discussions over, you know, push looks, it looks like push is coming to shove and that China is getting close to wanting to take Taiwan. Um, and Australia should be doing something about that and standing shoulder to shoulder with them. Obviously, it's never easy to talk about war. Um, no one really wins with war. Um, what we would, I guess, what we would hope to do is to free Taiwan or at least, you know, get the Chinese communists to back off. Well, I guess the, the best outcome is that China doesn't attack them at all, but, you know, uh, that's not looking positive. Well, deterrence is certainly a major part in preventing a war. And besides just AUKUS, uh, Australia is also a part of the Quad, which has seen you know a new life in the past couple of years. What is uh, what, what, what is the relationship between Quad and AUKUS? Uh, the, all these new security alliances, obviously aimed at China. Yeah, that's exactly right, Chris. I mean, they're all aimed at China, and and the Quad is. Uh, 
um, well, uh, you, know, you know, it's an, uh, a partnership between four countries who are all facing a common enemy. Um, you know, you've got Japan, who are obviously geographically very close to China. Um, you've got India, who share, you know, a, a border on the Himalayas with China and have been attacked. Um, you know, they had that dust up not that long ago. Um, and in fact, I think we just had another incursion um, on the Himalayas yesterday, uh, where some PLA soldiers accidentally wandered into Indian territory. The Quad is is super important because it brings you know the world's largest democracy in India together with the United States, Japan, and Australia. And I think between you know, those four countries, particularly as AUKUS um, perhaps kickstarts our Australia's defence capabilities, it brings, perhaps as you were saying, Chris, it, it, it could be uh, a mechanism that prevents China from taking any um, uh, overt steps to taking Taiwan. Um, although I think you, you have to ask yourself, is the question is, is, would is that going to stop communist china from taking taiwan now or is it just going to delay it i mean is it better if they attempt it now versus delaying it well militarily you'd have to think so it would be good if we could potentially uh fortify taiwan a little bit better and perhaps <laughs> um include them in some um joint war gaming and um practice exercises and those sorts of things in, in order for uh, the good guys to be better prepared. Um, but at the same, the same time, the longer it goes on, the stronger the Chinese military becomes. I mean, we've, we've seen their navy now become the, the largest navy in the world. And it's not just their navy. They have a maritime militia. Um, you can double hull boats that they have or double hull ships can, can do a lot of damage. Um, so I think the longer, in some senses, you wait, the more powerful they become. And if they can deny access to the region to the Americans um, or anybody for that matter, then, you know, it's all over. So it sounds like the delay, basically, it depends what we do with the time. Yeah, that's probably a fair point, Shelley. It, it depends on what we do with the time. And, you know, to give the, the US government their due, you know, they've initiated AUKUS together with us and, and the, the POMs. You know, the, the quad seems to be going quite well. Um, perhaps we could start doing more with Taiwan. So, yeah, uh, I think we're using that time quite well. But I think China are also using that time. So, you know, we've seen just in the, what, just in the last few months, look at the, the number of intercontinental ballistic missiles they have stood up across uh, western parts of, of China. Um, look what they're doing with their, uh, their, their jet incursions in Taiwanese airspace, including their, their, one of their newest aircraft um, that's similar to a Growler, so a, an electronic warfare, an EW sort of um, Aircraft, so they're it they're, looks like they're training uh, and preparing to attack pretty quickly. So I think you're touching on like a really important point here that uh, you know for all the talk of like durable coexistence, the Chinese Communist Party is a brutal authoritarian regime that is overtly at war with the West. Taiwan is just one of these issues. Uh, what can be done to fundamentally? resolve this issue. It's not a matter of just defending Taiwan because it's bigger than that. Uh, that's the $64 million question, Chris. Like, it's not going to go With away. inflation, that's not that much money. <laughs> yes. I understand you're having some uh, rather bad inflationary problems in the United States with $5 a gallon gas and uh, that Soon sort of we'll stuff. all be millionaires. <laughs> no, it's just temporary. Yes. <laughs> So I don't know. You know, I mean, I think that's a question for Tony Blinken and, um, you know, the State Department and those geniuses. Yeah, really, can we coexist with Chinese, with the communist Chinese? Personally, I don't think we can. I mean, we've seen their trajectory. We've seen what they continue to do. 
They don't stop. They keep going. It, it, they don't have elections. You know, this Xi guy has made himself emperor for life, but like, I don't think we should ever get into the discussion where we say it's only Xi, that Xi is the problem. He's not the problem. He's part of the system. He grew up in the system. He is just a part of the system. If there was some internal troubles that happened, you know, I, I don't think it will, but somehow they got rid of Xi, yeah, then perhaps you got a smarter guy that came in and started backing off a little bit. It's still only a matter of time before we get back to this situation. It's even worse. Mm-hmm. So yep. that's a really hard question to, to um, answer, Chris. Like, I, I mean, you just want to say we've got to get rid of the Chinese Communist Party, right? I mean, that's, that's the answer. But that's, how do you do that? Um, I don't know. We stop giving them money. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, but they have they have nuclear weapons, they have ICBMs, they have a massive military. Their navy is now larger than the United States. They they're not afraid to use trade sanctions um, for political purpose whenever it suits them. Um, they don't abide by any contracts, any rules. They're in the WTO. The, Bill Clinton brought them into the WTO. They they don't abide by the rules in the WTO. They don't ab- abide by treaties. They did a treaty with with the United Kingdom and then broke it and and then crushed Hong Kong. So I I can't see really what you can do with a regime like that. I I don't know. I mean, I I think it really does come down to we have to stop funding them. Because if you look at things like the power shortage, right, it's bad. It's so bad. And it's been bad since the summer. And it it kind of only started to uh, like Western media only started understanding how bad it was a couple weeks ago. But like you have factories that are only open one day a week mm. or two days a week. Um, they're so short on electricity. And like if that continued, that would be a huge blow to the Chinese economy. Now, of course, we're so interrelated now, it would affect the world economy. But with things like Evergrande, we're pumping so much money into Chinese companies, often Chinese state-run companies. BlackRock still says triple investment. They still are, say triple. We are funding really? the Chinese Communist Party. So if we had, you know, the things like the tariffs, if the trade sanctions, like when you start cutting off the funding, they do the economy is the primary thing for them. They have to keep that running or else they will face massive internal unrest. You know, things like the Australian coal thing that you mentioned, like when they they were trying they held a hundred uh, or they held a million metric tons of Australian coal for a year in ports. And then they they had no choice but to like you know let it come in because they needed it like these and that was of, still only a day's work yeah like if these <laughs> kinds of things continue it's going to spiral out of control for them you know and but like if we keep pumping money into their system we are propping them up well that's a really good point Shelley and I think we have to stop yeah the first thing to do is to stop propping them up stop funding them. Stop Wall Street pumping our, our 401k money. Uh, uh, um, over here in Australia, we call it superannuation. Um, and, and exactly right. It's try to, to push back. Instead of reducing tariffs, increase tariffs. However, I wonder, is it too late? So we could do all of these things or, or the United States could take the lead and do these things and that would cause some harm. And perhaps it might make them back off for a little while and wait out for a new administration. And maybe that maybe they wait 10 years, maybe they make 15, 20 years. Maybe they don't care what happens to their population. Uh, maybe maybe they treat their population like North Korea treats their population. You know, we all know that they spend more money on internal security than they do on external security, which is mind-blowing. And at the same time, they're all well, they will probably have willing trade partners from other parts of the world. Um, so I, w- you're absolutely right. We should stop funding them um, immediately. Um, we should take a more, I don't want to say an aggressive stance, but just call them out 
for what they do. Just announce the facts to the public so that the public is aware of, of their actions. Um, and yeah, maybe we can do some of those sorts of things and that'll help. I don't know, I'm not sounding very positive here. <laughs> I feel like, I mean, you're a defense guy and all the all the defense people we talk to, they, you know, you've been sounding the alarm for so long, right? Well, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you've, you've, I don't know if you've had um, U.S. Navy Captain Jim Fennell retired on, but, you know, he's he's been studying the rise of China as part of his career in Navy intelligence for 30 years. You know, he, he was let go by the Obama administration for simply mentioning that China was a potential threat. <laughs> like, um, what, all of those things that people like Jim Fennell and Grant Newsham and, and others have been saying for all of this time, and, and indeed Bill Triplett, um, who wrote The Year of the Rat, have been saying this since, you know, the, the 80s, um, if not before, and yet we have not heeded any of their advice. We Many businesses and elites have become tremendously rich, including our university system, and, and that's, that's the same here in Australia. Um, and, you know, people get rich, they, they don't mind looking the other way. So, yeah, from a defence perspective, from an Australian defence perspective, as I said before, you know, they're... Um, there's not a lot we can do without the United States. We're a very, very small defense force, so we have to fight alongside the, the Americans and or the British and uh, the Japanese and the Indians. So, uh, yeah, it really, unfortunately, comes back to we, the world is still led by you guys, um, and that's meaningful. Perhaps, you know, I used to live in America for a long time, and perhaps you don't realize that. But if you really are. You are the world leaders. You do represent the free world. Um, and, and other countries do follow you, admire you, listen to you, and want to be led. So I'm putting it all on your shoulders. Nothing we can do. <laughs> no, that's not true. We'll stand with you as we have always have. Um, that you can, you can count on most Aussies to do that. Well, yeah, I think as, as we've talked about, it really is a war of, perception. And, um, you know, at least I've noticed since when I started China Uncensored in like 2012, uh, I did it because I didn't think most Americans like even were thinking about China. And over the course of this like nine, 10 years, I've seen that change tremendously. And Australia too, like, as you said, the, the perception of China in, in, the, in the Australian population has changed dramatically. And it's all because of China Uncensored. <laughs> it might also because be because of like you know COVID and all, a bunch of other things. Nothing. Say so thank you, Chris. Okay. <laughs> well, so this is giving me hope that like you know, when the public's perception changes, that can drive a lot of change in you know the financial sector. Stop them from you know like how long can you know you talk about free trade with China when it's like hey we're we're involved in slave labor. Yeah, that that's a really good point and. Um, it has been a little bit doom and gloom for me. So I, I think, you know. I get it. You, you, <laughs> we are in a kind of tight spot down here in Australia. Isn't it? Um, but I think to the points that you, you Chris, and, and Shelley have made, I, you know, maybe it could make a difference. But we do, yeah, we have to hold them accountable. We have to stop funding the Chinese Communist Party. We have to not say, well, We'll take them to the WTO when they break the trade rules. We just have to slap tariffs on them, like like the former Trump administration did. I think was was fantastic because you take something to the WTO, it's about as useful as the UN. You know, it's going to take years before anything is done, and they don't listen to it in any case. So perhaps with those, if it was a coordinated effort by a number of countries from the United States, Australia, the Quad, and if we could get the Europeans on side. Sounds like a, a really difficult thing to do, um, but although you, you've seen, to your point too, Chris, is that we've seen perceptions in the UK change dramatically, also. So EU too, EU as well. Okay, yeah. um, not not as much. <laughs> well, I'm thinking like the trade deal that they were all gung ho about, and then like they stopped that. 
especially after China sanctioned like EU officials. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a fair point. Yeah, yeah, the the CAI, yeah, exactly. So I think if we could if we could do that in a coordinated fashion, um, perhaps it could make a difference. Um, I hope it can make a difference. Um, and and to your other point, Chris, you've been doing this since 2012. Thank you. Well done. You you've been doing it since the 80s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know a lot of Australians that that watch your show. Um, hmm. So you you're getting cut through and. Um, you know, certainly from the my American friends and, and you know some of them, um, what you do is is incredible and, and we need this kind of voice. We need your voice out there and uh, I know you, you probably don't want to hear this, but but you know a, a lot of people love the humor you bring to such an important topic. Um, mm. and, I, and I think that's that's cool too. Yeah. Oh. We, we do actually want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just remembering when we were in Australia in 2018 and, and uh, I spoke at the, what was it? The Australian Institute. Oh, oh the, the Sydney Institute. Sydney the Sydney Institute. Institute. Yes, that's right. You. Yeah. That was, that was a very interesting experience where some of the, uh, the higher ups in that organization were not entirely happy with my message about China, but in Australia. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but everyone in the audience was very, very happy about it. it seemed. Oh, well done. Um, oh, thank you. Um, well, so another question I have is, you know, China does have still tremendous influence around the world. Um, I think COVID is, is a great example, like how they spun that to their advantage. And I'm just wondering, you know, China has, has been pushing this zero COVID policy and I know Australia has something similar. Do you think there's any kind of like sense that like the, the Australian government was, uh, inspired by China's zero COVID policy, I don't. I don't know if we even want to get into all of this. Well, I, yeah, I know Matt does. Um, yeah, look, I think I think a lot of the world was duped, um, not just by China with regard to the virus, you know, being made and distributed by China, um, but also looked at the way that they handled it. And they came out and said, well, this is the way we're handling it by locking everything down. And, um, well, I don't think we welded anybody into their homes like the Chinese did. But um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of health bureaucrats probably looked at that and said, oh, well, geez, that seems to work there. Um, Lock people up. Don't let them go anywhere and you can't catch the virus, right? Um, And so... Perhaps that's a massive oversimplification and, and I'll get in trouble from the chief health officer of New South Wales and um, elsewhere. But I don't know. I, I mean, we'd have to ask them, but I mean. Well, what could they do to you? Put you under house arrest? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess there's not much more they can do to me. Um, you are you are talking to us from lockdown. I am talking to you from lockdown. Yes. Uh, we have a new premier of the state of New South Wales. I'm pleased to let you know. So premiers in our states are equivalent to your governors. So our new premier, who was newly installed as of Monday of this week, is a man named Dominic Perrottet, and he is uh, accelerating the timetable to freedom. So he's a little bit different to his predecessor. Uh, he, He doesn't bring out the chief health officer to provide daily updates. He is accelerating the time frame for children to go back to school and for the society to open up and for Australians to be able to travel overseas, for Australians to be able to come back. Um, so that's, that's, that's good news. So soon you'll be able to take Kevin Rudd back. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, mate. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, no, Kevin you- Rudd has had to kind of like – do a little bit of an about face when, where I think he's realized at least in the US the whole like absolutely re-engagement thing is not like that's that's not a message that's like politically okay right now so he's kind of pivoted a little bit to if we just get rid of Xi Jinping then you know that's he's the problem oh he's on that yeah. now is he yeah, you know that that anonymously written the longer telegram essentially made that argument that we the, the West should try to essentially depose Xi Jinping so the Communist Party can get like a more reasonable leader 
I think it's an open secret that it was written by Kevin Rudd. Uh, well, Kevin and then he's come out more recently with some more stuff that's kind of in the, well, no, like, China's not, gr- like, 100% good, like, the <laughs> kind of doing this thing about, like, oh, it's Xi Jinping's fault, you know. Yeah, so I th- as we talked about before, I think that's dangerous um, because you're just going to replace Xi Jinping perhaps for a, a small amount of time with someone who's going to bide their time and uh, and then hit us with an even bigger stick. Um, and the other thing, as you probably well know, because Kevin Rudd lives in your state, um, is that Kevin Rudd says different things to different audiences Um that whatever they want to hear. So he'll say things down in Australia that support the Australian Labor Party that says, well, Australia should be re-engaging and have an engagement policy with China. And then he'll say something completely different in the United States. For the engagement policy people, what kind of, like, what is their argument essentially? Like, what kind of China do they see us or Australia engaging with? Well, they don't see China as a threat. So firstly, they don't talk, very much about Hong Kong. They don't talk at all about the Uyghurs. They don't talk about Taiwan. Um, all you have to do is, and don't do this, but Google Paul Keating. Um, <clears throat> don't do that because um, we could just forget about him. He's you know, hopefully a non-entity, although he does have influence within the Australian Labor Party, which is why it concerns me. But so they don't talk about those things. And then they say that China is actually not an expansionary power, um, that they don't want to control anybody. Okay, I'm sure they're the Tibetans and the Uyghurs and the Hong Kong and Taiwan would disagree with them. Um, or India. Yeah, and southern Mongolia. <laughs> I mean, the, the list does kind of go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But so they, these are the things that they say, uh, and I don't, yeah, it blows the mind, right? Because you are either on the payroll or you are ideologically sympathetic with communism. And you think that that would be that being a vassal state. So they, the other thing that they say is that the United States is spent. You're done. And that China is going to... There's nothing you can do. China is going to win. They're going to be the biggest economy. They're going to be much bigger than you Americans. We don't like Americans in any case. Um, China is in our region. We are a South Asia country. We should be engaged with our region. You know, bugger the Americans. Um, You're done anyway, and you're not going to come and help us. So... We should put our lot in with China. So that makes absolutely no sense, but that's 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 what's behind their thinking. Well, so this is kind of why I brought up uh, some of the COVID policies, because like my, my concern is that there are plenty of people in, in government and big businessmen who see the authoritarian control the Chinese Communist Party has over society, and that is appealing to them. They would like to have that kind of power over their countries. Well, I mean, you know, the state in Australia with the most, uh, I would say, restrictive lockdown policies uh, has been uh, Victoria, and that is run by Premier Daniel Andrews, who is incidentally the premier who sort of independently signed a sort of a Belt and Road Initiative deal with China in like this weird way where the federal government was like, you can't do that. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. I mean, like, what's going on in, in Victoria? So Victoria is, is it's a little bit like California in that it's become a, a almost a one-party state. Um, I think the Liberal Party uh, would love to be able to get back into state government in Victoria, but I'm not sure that they would be that successful. I, I hope I'm wrong. Um I'm probably going to get a lot of people from Victoria and the Liberal Party being very angry at me for saying that. But um, you can see the same thing even in Queensland, which is the state to the north of me, where you've had just consistent Labor governments with with perhaps a one-term Liberal government here and there. 
And this is pretty much the same in Victoria. You've had a lot of Labor governments. And up until just very recently, um, Premier Daniel Andrews' polling has been good. Like, you know, you, you get people internal to, that, that are saying, well, he'd, he'd still be elected, despite, as you point out, Matt, that he unilaterally went out and signed a deal with the Chinese communists um, on, on Belt and Road Initiative, which generally states don't do because it's um, signing treaties and, and doing foreign trade deals is something that the federal government did, but we just didn't have anything on, on our books, um, legis- on our legislation that prevented it. This, this Liberal government has now um, put something on the books um, and has cancelled that deal and any other future deal. And in fact, it's retrospective. It can go back and look at any deal that any local state government has made that is not in the interest of Australia and it can be cancelled by the federal government. So so that's good. But yeah, so I think you're right um, that, um, yeah, perhaps there have been some some authoritarian sort, sorts of people like Dan Andrews that have looked at what China has done and, and copied it and done it in Victoria. So Victoria is now the, mo- the world's most locked down city, um, or Melbourne, Melbourne. Um, and it's a shame. Yeah, it's funny you compare it to California because I always thought of Melbourne as kind of like the, the San Francisco of Australia. You know, you got the, the trolleys and it's like a nice, friendly place. But also like... But but Victoria State being like California, with this governor in California, our governor. Uh, I, I used to live in California, but now in New York, their governor uh, was you know had faced this recall election for a number of things, including his uh, COVID hypocrisy, including basically keeping kids out of public schools, but then sending his own children to private schools, which which were in session, uh, as well as other things. But French yet, laundry. The, the French Laundry, which which I'm I'm just jealous because I always wanted to go there, uh, but but then he got you know he won his recall election he survived with like um you know sixty something percent support, uh, which to me was like mind boggling right that like like you you look at what he's done you think wow like how do people still support that and yet and yet they do so I think it's a it's an apt comparison you made. Yeah, and, and that's right. So I spent a lot of time in San Francisco, and I did my undergraduate at um, University of California. Go Bears! Yes, go Bears! Yes, and and, uh, and you you somehow ended up working for the Liberal Party. Yeah, <laughs> San Francisco, Berkeley, and conservative. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, that must I have been know. interesting. It was interesting. So I was there in the uh, early to mid nineties, and let's just say, lucky there were no smartphones around capturing uh, video and and stuff when I was there. So I was the, you know, I was the crazy Australian tearing stuff up. Um, but so I, I wouldn't say, you know, and I love San Francisco. Um, it's a beautiful city. And, and I look at just, even since I left at just how bad San Francisco has become, it is just disgusting. You've got junkies on the street shooting up. Um, you've got people defecating all over the place in public in front of you. Um, so I wouldn't say Melbourne is as bad as that. Um, you need to stop slandering my home city, even though I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> uh, are you from the Bay? You're obviously from the Bay yeah, Area. Yeah, I'm from San Francisco, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and I did actually briefly go to Berkeley, so we have that in common. Ah, ah, awesome. But yeah, no, San Francisco, I go back all the time and it's, it's you know, as you say. But that's that's not necessarily COVID related. That's just... No, other that's, factors. that's that's other factors, and and perhaps when you have a one party system, they can get away and, with whatever they like. And perhaps Victoria is becoming, and I hope it it doesn't become a one party state at a state level. Uh, I worry that it that it perhaps is. Um, and then when you have a one party state, I mean, China's a one party state. What well, what if Australia's you know had a one party state, but it was the Liberal Party? Well, I don't think that's good either. I don't think that's healthy. I mean, democracy, you need competition. So people need choice and they need freedom. They need to be able to say, uh, you're hopeless, we're voting you out. Minority voices. Yeah, yeah. And 
you know, I mean, you do that and then hopefully you don't have interference and you don't have too much interference in the democratic process and people's voices and votes are heard and they count and they matter. Um, how Victoria gets around that, I don't know because, you know, they do have a choice. Um, they can vote whatever they like. Um, but they seem to keep voting the Labor Party back in. So, yeah, it's, it's got me. As, as California keeps voting the Democrats back in. Except for Schwarzenegger. Yeah. <laughs> We're just proving that there's really no accounting for taste. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this, was, this was great to catch up on the situation in Australia and the progress being made combating the Chinese Communist Party. I think it's progress. Let's end on a note of hope. I think so. Yeah. I know that might be yeah. strange for all of us. No, t- tell us again how great our show is. Well, <laughs> it is no. great. You, well, you, I mean, we as talked you, about a spray bottle last time. You, you started in 2012 when, you know, you guys are the original. You started in 2012 saying stuff that wasn't popular. Just like PewDiePie. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, kudos to you. Um, you know, one last thing I'd say is uh, that I forgot to mention is that, you know, we are trying our best down here. Um, you know, this government's doing some good things, as, as I've mentioned in the podcast. My branch is actually going to be hosting a Taiwan MP. I can't just give you his name yet, but he's obviously from the DPP. Great. And and working with guys like and girls like you, um, yeah, keeping up the fight. Really appreciate it. Well, good. We're with you. We love Australia. We love your spirit and your meat pie. <laughs> yeah, maybe someday we can go back. We're just running out of places to go. Like in 2018, we went to Australia and New Zealand. We can't go to either of those places. In 2019, we went to Hong Kong several times. We can't go now. We can't go back to the Scarborough Shoal. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> oh, I saw that it's... one. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That was fun. Very dangerous. I can't believe we did it. I, can't, we I couldn't believe you did it either. You know, it, was, it was actually kind of stupid. Who who even was, organized that trip? It was your idea, yeah. Matt. And we were just like, yeah, okay, this sounds good. Yeah, sounds and then fine. in the when we were on the fishing boat, I was like, this may have been a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's we, a little late. We, but we again, made it back a lot. And for the record, I put the China uncensored flag on the Scarborough Shoal, so I own that territory. <laughs> so period. Awesome. <laughs> perception uh, is reality. Perception is reality. <laughs> well, I mean. I just hope it doesn't keep going because the last place we went to was Taiwan. Uh, Are we cursed? (laughs) Well, if I were you guys, I wouldn't even fly anywhere near China. I would stay so far away. I'd I'd say you're probably on a list or two. I actually Mm. don't think they really care about us. Don't say that, Shelly. <laughs> is that is that is that wounding? <laughs> it's I'm, Xi Jinping thinks about me every day. Okay. <laughs> Someday you'll get your interview. Someday I'll get yeah. that interview. <laughs> well, thanks for the the advice. Uh, that's terrifying <laughs> to think. I'll just move to the middle of the United States, as far away from China as possible. Where should people go if they want to hear more from you? Uh, they shouldn't. I don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're not very good at this. Are no, you? I'm not. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, I don't have a website or uh, anything. So, I mean, I'm a member of the Liberal Party. I chair uh, Defence Sec Policy. You don't even have a Twitter? Oh, yeah, I am on Twitter. Yeah, Lincoln Parker, at Lincoln Parker 5. Sorry, I, <laughs> I, I didn't do that very well. <laughs> it's okay. A link, uh, a Lincoln Parker, not Lincoln Park. Yes, right, yes. That that name has dogged me for for so long, and um, <laughs> I've been doing. Uh, I've been on Sky News uh, a little bit recently, so they they put you on, and you're listening to the producers before you actually you know, the host comes on, and they're just ripping into me about my name, and, they, you know, they're <laughs> <laughs> and wow, so, yeah. Sorry, we missed our chance. <laughs> yeah, well, you could have, yeah. So, um, and then, of course, everyone in Australia spells it L A N K E N. Let's make sure we spell it right. <laughs> we have a president with that name. We'll be fine. That's true. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll put uh, uh, your Twitter account below. So, 
expect big follows. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Love what you do. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I was thinking a lot about what Lincoln said about how Australia really still looks to the U.S. to be mm-hmm. the leader, like to you know, as the to be the global superpower. Um, and I was thinking about how there's been discomfort, right, in the U.S. domestically about with the idea, with the idea that the U.S. Oh, why do like we we, we shouldn't be a superpower or like we're not why, the police of the world. Why do we need a superpower, right? Yeah. And I can understand some of that with like you know things that happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, but like. If, you know, we are obviously going into, like, a new Cold War with the Chinese Communist Party, believing, you know, from the time that they started in 1949 that America is a threat to their very existence. Mm -hmm. They haven't stopped that. So, you know, unless you'd have to basically do the burying your head in the sand thing. Yeah. Well, this was something that was discussed recently at the Oslo Freedom Forum in Miami, that Yeah, this is a Cold War. All the major authoritarian countries are banding together in common cause to attack and undermine the West, whether you're talking about troll farms in Russia or, you know, everything the Chinese Communist Party is doing. So there's really no, you know, if the U.S. steps back, that just creates a massive power vacuum that will be filled by an authoritarian regime like Russia or the Chinese Communist Party. It's going to be, it's going to be the Chinese Communist Party. It's going to be China, yeah. But like, it, yeah, it, was it Leopoldo Lopez that brought this up? That like I think so. The, the Venezuelan Benz- opposition leader. That the idea that like yes, all of these authoritarian countries are working together. Therefore, and he was talking to human rights activists that activists from around the world who are fighting in the authoritarian re- regimes have to, you know, connect with each other and unite and work together and be willing to fight. Right? He said like the most important thing is the will to fight back against these regimes. And well, well, that that's why one of the main tactics of the Soviet Union and the Chinese Communist Party is, you know, psychological warfare to implant these ideas in Americans that the U.S. is, you know, the worst country in the world, worse than anybody else. We shouldn't do anything. We or step back. also that it's just not worth fighting. Right. Because Lincoln was right when he was like, it is difficult to talk about war because it's sacrifice people are going to die like it is difficult to talk about this but you know at the same time we've seen and we've done episodes about this how the chinese communist party's like political information warfare against taiwan includes things like trying to convince the rest of the world that taiwan's just not worth saving mm-hmm. perception you know? warfare like a, a a article in the business insider Uh, written by an American who says something like, you know, is Taiwan really worth like a nuclear war? Like, like as if the the Chinese Communist Party is going to like launch nukes at the U.S. You know, it's just like trying to stop you from even considering fighting. Where and like as as Lincoln was saying that, like, if China does take Taiwan, that's it. The U.S. is no longer a superpower. China will dominate the region. Yeah, I mean, I don't, th- I don't think it's as much about the U.S. not being a superpower as what it does to all the countries. Mm-hmm. Well, know. no, I think that is that that is the end of the U.S. as a superpower right. because every country in Asia, and that even includes Australia, will have to completely recalculate the balance of power with China being the dominant force because the U.S. failed. Well, I mean, I don't think it's. Like, I don't want to make it seem like it's about whether or not the U.S. has the status of a superpower. It's about who is filling that vacuum now. Exactly. It's it's either, you know, the 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 U.S. beliefs of freedom and democracy or the Chinese Communist Party. The loss of the U.S. as a superpower means China is the superpower. And that should be terrifying to everyone. And and this goes back to what we were saying before about authoritarian regimes like China essentially supporting all these other authoritarian regimes like Venezuela and Cuba and Russia and the like creating, you know, what was it the it was like four billion people in the world today. Four point two billion. Live under some kind of authoritarian regime. Mm-hmm. And it's only gonna get worse. Yeah. If that if if, you know, Taiwan falls, if uh the Chinese Communist Party consolidates power over the region and then starts to move. You know, yeah, it's it's just going to be bad. And 
And I was thinking about, you know, the Biden administration's whole, like, we need to work with allies thing, which is like a double-edged sword, right? Cleo was here and Mm -hmm. she pointed out that, you know, it depends which allies you're talking about. Um, But if the U.S. can do it in the right way, right? Like um, Lincoln was saying, Australia is with us. Mm -hmm. Like if we can do it in the right way. And like, I think the U.S., Australia, like the AUKUS pact and quad, like these are things that can just like, Leopoldo Lopez was saying about activists fighting authoritarianism around the world have to band together the the countries that are still liberal democracies that are still that are fighting authoritarianism have to you have to work with our allies. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I guess I don't know. Yeah, the world is dividing into essentially good and evil. It's a spiritual warfare happening. But I think communicating that to people or uh, We're communicating that to you. Spiritual war, good and evil. Uh, don't look at me. I, I'm just thinking about meat pie. I've actually been thinking mostly about Lincoln Park. Ah, <laughs> oh, crikey. Spiritual war, Lincoln Park. All right. I, I, I think, you know, for the sake of our of our viewers and listeners. Look, we're still a little jet lagged from coming back from Miami. So that's going to be my It's excuse. the same time zone. We're not going to, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for watching. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley John. And I'm Matt Ganesta. We'll talk to you next time.